August 1st, um, Stephen German, um, who has been the mastermind along with his partner um, in business and life, Lorraine, of our Bennington gathering since 2009 for the last 12 years. Um, he passed away on August 1st after a five-year battle with cancer. Um, and I'd like to invite Lorraine to say a few words about Steve before we begin. Um, after she's finished, I'm gonna walk us through a, a slide presentation in memory of both Steve and another Stoneware Collectors Group regular, Lisa Elfritz, who passed away unexpectedly on September 7th. Uh, so without any further ado, um, Lorraine, um, the, the, the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm not going to talk too long. I just want to thank you all for all the condolences I got. I got a tremendous amount of support, not only from the Stoneware group, but from the antiques community in general. And it's really meant a lot to me. Um, I also want to give my condolences to Lisa and her family, because that was a real shock to everybody. Uh, Steve and I love putting these Stoneware events together. And I know he'd be really happy to know that there are others like Kevin and um, all the others, um, Warren Broderick and John and everybody else who's shown an interest in um, taking up where we left off. And even though I don't have the energy to um, do it anymore, I'm definitely gonna show up at the next one in um, May so I can see you all and I'll be setting up um, selling stoneware again. And I also want to thank Jamie and Dina and everybody at the Bennington Museum for all the support they've given us over the years. And I'm really glad that we're going to continue our collaboration with you guys. And with that, I'm just going to turn things back over to Jamie. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lorraine. And so um, I've just prepared a, a, a brief little slideshow with some photographs um, of both Steve and Lisa. And I'm going to um, share my, my screen. So here is Steve, probably at um, one of our um, previous Benning Bennington um, um, Stoneware Group meetings um, with his um, contagious smile. Um, Steve, as I got to know him over um, the decade plus that um, um, we collaborated together on these Stoneware Collector Group meetings and particularly the lectures at the museum on Friday evenings. It was always a pleasure to have him roll into town on Friday afternoon um, with his smile. Um, here is Steve and Lorraine at their wedding. They were married in 2000 um, and started um, dealing in antiques um, in 2001. Um, and, you know, Steve and Lorraine um, were a, an, an incredible um, partnership. Here's them. I think this might be at the Hartford show. I'm not not sure exactly with two incredible pieces of stoneware, though they they um, sold antiques of, of many kinds, early American um, antiques. Um, stoneware really was one of their 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 main specialty and passion. And they they sold and, and helped um, collectors find um, and refined in some cases, um, really some of the best and most exceptional examples of decorated 19th century American stoneware. Here is Steve and Lorraine again at one of the um, previous um, Bennington Stoneware Collector Group programs. So we typically have a presentation like this. Typically in the past, they've been on Friday, Friday afternoons, and then the sale is on Saturday um, in Bennington. It used to be at Camelot Village. Um, um, I'm sure that we'll be announcing um, 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 what the plans are for future meetings coming up next May in the spring. Um, you know, fingers crossed um, again. I know I said this last time we'll be able to meet in person again next year. Um, um, I, I think some of the details are still being ironed out, but um, we'll let everybody know as soon as we have them. Um, and here is Stephen Lorraine again um, at one of the um, um, I'll call them after parties at um, Michael and Marty Sargent's house um, after the um, um, stoneware talks and dinners on Friday afternoons. Um, and here's Steve and, and Marty Sargent. And uh, here's Steve and Lorraine chatting with um, Luke Zip. Um, of course, Luke and his family run Crocker Farms and they've been very generous and um, made their way up to Bennington um, from, from Maryland. Um, and set up booths and previewed some of their upcoming lots. Um, and of course, they um, um, have really been bringing some incredible stoneware to market in the, over the course of the last decade as well. Here's Steve on the right, um, 
um, with George Browning and Pete Schreiber, um, two regulars um, at our Stoneware Collector Group, group meetings. I'm always set up with wonderful um, selection of um, Stoneware on, on the Saturday sales. Um, here's Steve um, um, with, I think that's Birds of Bennington in his hand with Anthony Archambault, a, a collector um, that I know. Um, well, who um, makes it up as often as he can to Bennington do our, during our, our sales and, and, and talks. And, uh, another picture of Steve at, at one of the Bennington sales with um, a, a collector, Brian LaPierre. Here's Steve with his infectious smile with Celia Sladek. Um, John Sladek gave our, our last um, um, presentation, our first digital presentation back um, last spring. Um, and this is them. Um, John took this photograph of Steve and Celia at one of the Albany um, meetings. And we've done a couple of meetings over in Albany at the um, um, State Museum um, where the Weitzman collection is. Um, and John was saying that this was after um, um, Steve had tracked down a piece that John had sold back in the 1980s, a, a, a Harrington Lions piece. Um, and Steve as he often would, went out of his way to track it down and find it so that he um, could sell it back to um, John, so John could add it back to his incredible collection of Rochester and Lyon stoneware. Here's Steve with Lou Scranton. Um, Lou is another one who we've lost in the last few years, but Lou was um, a regular at our Bennington meetings and a, a real wonderful um, um, generational figure in, in the American antiques and and um, early pottery um, business. And it was just a wonderful picture of Steve and Lou um, at Lou's on-site sale that was held by Skinner's a few years ago um, before he passed away. Here's Steve on the right with his back to us. And on the left is our tonight's presenter, Jude Hanley, um, here looking at and talking about stoneware at Tim Bailey's um, um, shop um, over there um, in, in the Troy Albany area. Um, um, Tim's shop is kind of um, a mecca for stoneware collectors and, and dealers and scholars. Here's a picture with, with Steve in the center um, with um, Curtis Rice, um, another um, regular. He, though he lives down in Virginia, he tries to make it up to Bennington when he can. This was them connecting down in Williamsburg at the Williamsburg show when Steve and Lorraine did that a few years ago. Here's Steve on the left um, with um, Laura and Bob um, Beeman, who again are regulars here in Bennington. Um, those infectious smiles. It's one of the things that I love about um, this Stoneware Collectors Group is um, we, we've, I forged friendships with many of these people as, as many of us have. And it's kind of like a, 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 a family to many of us. Here's a photo with Steve's back center left with Charlie Flint, um, another Bennington regular. I'm taking some of his friends out to, to lunch down there in, in Northwestern Connecticut. And here's Steve um, again with the stoneware that he loved so much. Um, I don't know which show this was. This might have been Hartford a couple of years ago. And as we mentioned, um, we also lost Lisa Elfritz unexpectedly. Um, just about a, a, a week, week and a half ago. Um, and here is her holding what I think was at the time um, a world record for stoneware, which was sold down at Crocker Farms in 2014, if I remember correctly. Um, a wonderful upstate New York piece with um, um, four Civil War um, soldiers on it. And here's Lisa with a, a wonderful um, roulette decorated um, Cushman um, Paul Cushman pitcher. Um, Lisa was known for her love of early stoneware pitchers um, and had many in her collection. And then finally, here's a wonderful picture of Lisa on the left with Tim Bailey on the right um, with, with a piece they called the Brown um, um, Star Jug. Um, I know this has a story connected to it. And maybe if Tim or somebody else who knows it wants to share it in the chat. Um, but we really um, will miss Steve, certainly, um, who played such an important role over the course of the last um, 
half dozen years um, in bringing these stoneware collectors groups meetings together in Bennington and Lisa as well, who was an active member both in Bennington and, and more generally in the stoneware collectors world. And we will miss them both. So we just wanted to honor and remember them um, before today's program. Now I would like to um, introduce our presenter um, this evening. Um, um, our presenter is Jude Hanley. Um, Jude likes to joke that his new book is coming out someday. Um, meanwhile, for the last 10 years, he's been researching the local potteries of Troy, Lansingburg, and Albany in an attempt to retrieve as much lost history um, as he can. Jude is an art teacher um, going into his 29th year with the North Colony Central School District. Um, he earned his BFA from Alfred University um, and uh, an MS in education from Boston University and the College of St. Rose. Jude has recently given talks on stoneward, stoneware at the Lansingburg Historical Society, um, the Monroe Clay Works, and the Bennington Museum at one of our previous um, stoneware collector groups meetings. Today, um, Jude will be discussing George Lent and Sons. Born in 1774, George Lent was one of the most influential early American potters. Um, he spent time working in Cornwall, Albany, Troy, Poughkeepsie, and Lansingburg, New York. Along the way, he would help define the upstate New York style that prevailed over the first half of the 19th century. Jude is with us live tonight, but for logistical purposes, he's pre-recorded his presentation. Um, we will play that um, video, and after it's done, um, we will invite people to ask questions they might have, and Jude can answer them in person. And with that, um, I will begin the pre-recorded presentation. Hello, my name is Jude Hanley, and I'll be talking about the potter George Lint, best known for his work in Troy and Lansingburg. And I'll be sharing as much of my research as I can with you um, for this presentation. Uh, before I begin, I do want to start uh, acknowledging some indispensable resources, should you want to go further. Uh, William Ketchum's Potters and Potteries of New York State. Uh, you probably own this if you're watching this presentation. The, the New York Stoneware Bible. Uh, if you're focused on the capital region like I am, for Albany and Troy and its surrounding areas, uh, Bill Bauck and Warren Broderick wrote Potteries. Pottery Works, I'm sorry, Pottery Works. Potteries of New York State's Capital District and Upper Hudson Region. And just a fantastic book. Uh, very in-depth on Albany, Troy, and so forth. So must have. Uh, if you're interested in Poughkeepsie, Poughkeepsie Potters and the Plague by George Lukacs. Uh, reads beautifully. Uh, really a fun book to read. A good sense of humor and pictures you won't see anywhere else. And uh, we also have Leland Brannan's The Early Makers of Handcrafted Earthenware and Stoneware in Central and Southern New Jersey. I wouldn't say it's a great title, but fantastic book. And if you want to start to understand New Jersey, like I'm trying to do, uh, great thing to have. And uh, one other great book, which I don't have my copy with me, I actually lent it to a friend, uh, The Cornwall Potters of Orange County, New York by Chester Faber. Uh, a, he's done, uh, like I've done with Lent, he has researched the Cornwall Potteries uh, to the best they can be. And I do hope his book comes, gets out in print again, because it is fantastic. So let's begin with uh, George Lent beginning. George Lent begins uh, his life. He's born into New Jersey. Where? We know it's on uh, January 2nd, 1774, thanks to a sampler that was made by uh, his youngest daughter, Eliza Ann. Uh, she sewed the names of the family members where they were born and so forth. Uh, so we know that he's born in New Jersey, 1774. And we also know he gets married to a woman named Elizabeth Dean. The Deans are a big family in New Jersey. Elizabeth Dean was born in New York. I'm going to guess in Westchester County where there are a lot of lens. Uh, so anyway, they get together. And the first time George is going to show up on a piece of paper is in Poughkeepsie uh, at the 
Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, in their records, it shows that they had their youngest son, John. He was born on August 10th, and he was baptized in the church on September 25th. And uh, this is an important day, because on September 25th, in that very church, I'm guessing at the same ceremony, uh, the mayor makes an impassioned speech to his, to his uh, congregation. Uh, his townsfolk, not his congregation. Uh, and this is, this is I found this all in uh, George Lukacs' book. Uh, he makes a plea for, uh, to help out the people of New York City who are suffering from yellow fever. And they're gathering food and supplies and they're going to send it down uh, to the city and try to help them out. And part of the reason we know about this is because there's a butter pot, big stoneware butter pot, with a bird on one side and a floral decoration on the other. And it's inscribed to the people in New York City, uh, October 6, 1798. It's made at the Egbert and Williams Pottery. And this is uh, not a fact, but I'm gonna assume that the bird looks like such a Lent bird and the pot has Lent characteristics that it is very, very possible that George went down to the pottery and lent his services. Uh, I don't know if they lived in Poughkeepsie or if they were just uh, at the church for the, the big ceremony. There was no Dutch Reformed Church in Cornwall at the time. In fact, they were building one in 1798. And so I, I think it's very possible that he was living in Cornwall and they made the trip to Poughkeepsie for this big event, his first son being baptized. Uh, the reason I say I think he may have lived in Cornwall is George is found on the census in 1800 and 1801, uh, living and working in Cornwall. Uh, here we are at the end of 1798, and uh, George is in town. We know that for a fact. And uh, if he went down there to lend his services, uh, that makes sense. People are saying, I've got extra blankets, I've got food. And George says, I can help make something. So he makes a presentation pot. On October 6th, that pot is presented, and that may be one of the first uh, signs we know about Lent. Uh, like I said, he's found in Cornwall. And what makes it even cooler is uh, they, did a, they did a sample dig at the um, Clark Pottery in Cornwall. Uh, Clark not being Nathan Clark. Uh, this is uh, a pottery run by David Clark, which was Nathan's uncle and uh, owned by David's father, Jeremiah Clark. And Nathan is also there. Nathan Clark and George Lynn appear in those census living actually a couple doors down from each other. So it's assumed that Nathan um, apprenticed there. Uh, Nathan's a bit younger. And Lent was probably a journeyman potter at the time, but working at Cornwall. And because we know he's there and it's that early, it's possible that Lent also apprenticed in Cornwall. I think it's more likely he worked in New Jersey, just trying to keep it simple. Uh, but I have to uh, allow for the possibility he may have worked in Cornwall. And here's a piece attributed to Cornwall. And Cornwall doesn't seem to have ever used the open handles. They seem to have uh, gone to uh, pushing the handles on the body early, which is something that certainly the capital district embraced, uh, all the entry. Uh, all open handles didn't really make it the way of the Hudson. And so this early pot, again, not saying Lent made it, but this is an example of a Cornwall attributed piece. And it's hard to say if Lent just worked there or may have learned there. All right, so in uh, uh, talking to Chester Faber, he had relayed a story to me about how when they went to the Clark Pottery to do a, a just a test dig in a small plot of land, he said they literally stuck the shovel in the ground and pulled up a pot chart with Lint's name on the bottom of it, which I, having dug myself and knowing how long you can dig before you find anything, uh, how cool that it just was sitting there on the ground waiting to be found. Uh, in 1800 and 1801, we know George is in Cornwall. He's working at Cornwall. He's getting experience at Cornwall. I believe he's making a friendship with Nathan Clark, which would turn out to be important later. Um, and in 1802, we find George Lent up in Greenbush, New York, which is right near Troy. And so he's made his way to Troy. I don't know what brought him to Troy, other than Troy is uh, a, a newly incorporated city. It's thriving. And he may have been looking for a way to make 
more money. He has a personal fortune of $150. And I'm not sure it works because in 1803, he's still in Greenbush on the tax rolls, but he has $120 to his name. Uh, he does have a, a young son, George Lent Jr. Uh, he's going to be born in 1804, and he's born in Troy. However, uh, October 12th, the Albany Register, uh, which a newspaper, uh, has George Lent of Bath, has two letters waiting for him at the Albany Post Office. The reason this is important, I think it's, uh, it's a good bet that Lent is working in Troy at the William Capron factory, and Lent is working for Josiah Chapman at the Troy factory. He's a German, journeyman, he's going back and forth. They're, his services are probably uh, wanted, uh, given the, his artistic ability, and he's trying to earn money for his family, which is growing and growing. In 1806, his daughter Nancy is born in Bath, so he's still there. Uh, in 1808, George Lent of Greenbush has a letter waiting for him in the Albany Post Office. Uh, and in 1810, uh, George Lent has a, a letter waiting for him back in Bath. Uh, or I should say, George Lent of Bath has a letter waiting for him at the Albany Post Office. So, uh, you know, he's a renter. I don't know how it worked back then, but he seems to be going back and forth quite often, uh, moving his family around. Uh, but in 1810, according to the U.S. Census, he's living in Troy, New York. So that takes us up to 1810. Uh, let's take a break here and look at a little stoneware uh, to give you a sense of this period. Um, from the 1802 to 1810 window, uh, Josiah Chapman, factory in Troy, working uh, extensively, and I... I got permission from the owner of the building that still stands, believe it or not, and uh, was able to dig, and I've got thousands of shards. Uh, some of the, the more interesting pieces uh, are these medallions that you've seen probably attributed other places, and I can't say they weren't done there, but the sun face is certainly done in Troy. Uh, the four hearts decoration. Uh, this flower, which I've only found on one jug so far, it's probably out there. Uh, it's interesting, it's like an incising from the top of a jug. Uh, looks like some kind of a fishtail. Uh, this is part of a, uh, this is T and R of the word Troy. Uh, the stamp Troy, uh, we know because I have a friend with a pot with a complete pot with the word Troy. So it's neat to find that one. Uh, there are a lot of these pieces, like this jug right here, that feature this decorated border around the circle of the medallion. And so there's the four petal motif. There are a lot of different variations of these. And I can't say they weren't done uh, Certainly we know Xerxes Price did some. Uh, they probably did them at Old Bridge. Uh, Green may have even started this and Lent may have continued, but I feel quite certain that this is a Lent made jug. Uh, it's got the four petal medallion. It's got a Lent style handle, whether Lent made these or not. Uh, we often refer to this as the Lent style, where a small handle plugged into the base, Tim Bailey calls it the plugged in handle. There's not a lot of swooshing around the outsides. It's very clean, right? Dressed up with a little bit of cobalt, right? And often the fluted uh, edge. And one of the things that has become a Lent uh, trademark, certainly, uh, is this single line around the, uh, getting away from the, the reeded neck and the, the multiple toolings around there. Uh, Lent, whether he invented it or learned it at Cornwall, Poughkeepsie, uh, however he came about it, he really took to the single line, which becomes kind of the dominant style in stoneware. But he's doing it back in 1805, 18, 1808, 1810, maybe as late as 1815. Right? Uh, and we know this all came from the Chapman factory because I was lucky enough to find uh, an incredibly rare 
part of a stamp of the Chapman factory stamp. Uh, Tim Bailey had one of the three known marked pieces uh, in his shop for a long time. We were able to prepare it. It is in fact, that is the MAN of Chapman. And this was found right among all the other pieces. So that's just some of the many, many shards that I've uh, found. But that gives you a, an idea of the time period. Now, one other really important part of the time period up here in Troy and Albany is in the earlier pieces, not just the handle pushed up against the body. You do see that with Warren and other people. Uh, but this, this plastering it on the side, taking the thumbs and pushing it and really mushing it against there. In the earliest Albany and Troy pieces, that seems to be a real common thing. And it gets refined and you see less and less of this as time goes on. But the early pieces, uh, they don't seem to have really put a lot of aesthetic into the handles. And I think uh, that was just ensuring they were gonna stay on. I'm sure it was a lot faster than dealing with the drying times and the, the waiting on the open handles, right? And so this piece is actually done in an Albany slip on the outside. Uh, don't know, I couldn't say for sure if this is uh, either uh, Capron or Cushman or Chapman, but it's definitely an early piece. And I'd like to thank Dave Braden for coming up with this piece. All right, so that's the early period. And we're moving on. And the reason we're moving on is 1813. We're going to jump ahead a little bit. That's when uh, Lint gets his own place. He, he's going to uh, start his own stoneware factory. And uh, as uh, the documents show, he does it on uh, land that was leased by Josiah Chapman back in 1808. 1813, uh, Lent is working on his own. He's got an advertisement in the newspaper and he's letting people know that he's making stoneware. In 1815 and 1816, he's uh, the fire warden of Troy, which I think is a type of honor, from what I can tell. And in 1816, uh, the Boynton brothers have started their stoneware factory in Troy, uh, I'm sorry, in Albany. And uh, George Lent is stepping it up. And I think all of stoneware is starting to become more popular. It's starting to sell, right? 1816 is also when Seymour, uh, Israel Seymour, uh, takes control of the Chapman factory. Chapman, <laughs> I, I'm convinced it was not a potter. Uh, I think he was a bit of a shady business person. And Chapman kind of disappears from Troy, uh, ends up down in Pennsylvania. And Seymour asserts control. Uh, he likely bought the pottery from Chapman. And so uh, it is, it's thought that Seymour and Lent went head to head. In fact, uh, Lent buys the building across the street from the Chapman factory, it opens up a store and warehouse to sell his work. His pottery itself is a couple uh, blocks down from the Chapman factory. A fact that he advertises in his advertisement uh, in the newspaper, and makes me think that they weren't so much competing as working together somehow. I don't know that you would mention your competitor if you're trying to sell your ware. Uh, so you've got Lent and, and Israel Seymour selling a lot of stoneware out of their places. And that's where you're gonna see something like my only marked Lent. Uh, finding a marked Lent is a really challenging thing. And the most interesting thing about this one is it's not interesting. This is the only marked George Lent I've ever seen, uh, internet included, with no decoration on it. Clearly, he was a, he was a decorator uh, at heart. Uh, but this is a very rare piece in that it's just a plain jug. It's got your lint plugged handle. It's got your single line around the spout. It's Mark George Lent Troy, G Lent Troy actually. And there's nothing else distinguishable about it. Uh, Lent has lost the foot, whether it was just a sign of the times or something he never cared for when he was working for Chapman. Right. But there's a George Lent 
jug. Representing the 1813, uh, it could be possibly made as late as 1823, maybe, so, but it's somewhere in there. And so uh, his Troy output, uh, there's certainly some beautiful pieces. Uh, Tim Bailey has a, a, a beautiful piece at his shop. Uh, it looks like this. And so while Lent is in business in Troy, 1813 to 1823, uh, stoneware is on the rise the whole time. I assume he's doing better and better. Uh, in 1823, uh, Lent and Israel Seymour and company uh, both place ads in the newspaper. And in, it's, it's been asserted that uh, they were in a fierce rivalry, uh, intense competition, and they put their ads right next to each other. But first of all, I don't, I don't believe you have a choice where your ad goes in a newspaper. Uh, and I, don't, I, I find it hard to believe they would choose to put them next to each other. Uh, and if you actually read the ads, uh, George Lent writes, a stoneware of the first quality, equal if not superior to any manufacturer in the United States. Merchants from the country are invited to call before they purchase and examine for themselves. Wear packed in crates or otherwise on the shortest notice and all orders from merchants faithfully executed and wear forwarded on reasonable terms. Well, Israel Seymour and company, uh, if he was truly in uh, <laughs> direct competition, probably would not have said that their stoneware factory ex is extensively in operation and have on hand a large assortment of ware of the first quality, equal if not superior to any manufactured in the United States. Merchants from the country are invited to call before they purchase and examine for themselves. Ware packed in crates or otherwise on the shortest notice and all orders from merchants faithfully executed and ware forwarded on reasonable terms. They both use the exact same language which makes me wonder if they aren't splitting the cost of an ad and simply running it, since what are the chances they would have the exact same language in competing advertisements? 1823 uh, brings about change, and uh, there's a lot of things going on in 1823. William Nichols, uh, the Poughkeepsie Potter, who was working with Dorelli Williams for a time, uh, in May of 1823, he starts his own factory starts marking where William Nichols and in September of 1823 Nichols uh, tragically is in an accident and dies and uh, to help out the family Nathan Clark who uh, Nichols had apprenticed under uh, is going to, to take care of the pottery and sell it and help out uh, the family and so Nathan Clark sells it to a, a Poughkeepsie uh, merchant, William Reynolds. Well, William Reynolds is not a potter. And somehow William Reynolds uh, gets in contact with George Lent. And George Lent's going to agree to buy half that pottery and work in Poughkeepsie. Now, a really interesting part of this story. So it is on February 10th that William Reynolds uh, actually buys the Nichols pottery, 1824. And on February 25th, Lent sells his pottery on Hill Street to William Lundy and Ron Russell Ellsworth. So there must have been quick communication and uh, Reynolds no more than owns the pottery than George Lent's uh, ready to, to join this. And skip ahead now to August 24th, 1824. And I find this angry letter uh, in the National Advocate newspaper uh, the passengers of the Olive, Olive Branch steamboat are furious over this event that happened down the river that uh, the, a boat called the Chancellor was coming down. It didn't give way and they were forced into the rocks and uh, they, these passengers insist their captain did nothing wrong and they want to make it clear that what the Chancellor did was, was horrible. And they list the passengers on the boat and who is on the boat but George Lent Benjamin Lent, his son, and Sylvester Nichols. Now, Sylvester Nichols uh, is a relation of William Nichols and was kind of a right-hand business partner with Nathan Clark. So it sounds like Nichols is uh, escorting uh, the Lents or somehow they're working together and 
Sure enough, this boat was going from Albany to Poughkeepsie. The chance of this letter being there with these people on board is just a stroke of luck, but it indicates that there was this working relationship and that Nichols, uh, working for Clark likely, was seeking out the lens and attract, uh, trying to attract them to the, to the uh, location. Part of me wonders if George Lent wasn't trying to set up his son, Benjamin Lent, another potter, who has been working down in New Jersey in his back home. Uh, he had a failed attempt in Troy with uh, Fellers and Alexander, and, and it's something that didn't seem to get off the ground. And is it possible that George Lent was trying to find a location for Ben Lent uh, to set up a new operation? And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing a bit here, but the fact that they're on this boat and they're going to Poughkeepsie is just amazing. And uh, when Lent does finally buy a half interest of the pottery from Reynolds on November 2nd, um, George Lukacs talks about how George Lent is referred to as if he's already been a town resident for a time. And so th there's, that lends some credence to the idea. Um, now, oddly enough, so Lent is out of Troy in 1824. He's already sold his pottery um, back in February. And I'm not sure why I came across an ad in 1825, July 13th. There's an ad for the old, the same ad I had read to you. Uh, George Lent's ad is running in the newspaper. And maybe a mistake. Maybe they just had space and they popped something in there, not realizing it. Um, I think it was just a mistake. And the ad didn't belong there. But uh, just a, a quirk, nonetheless. Now, nothing that I've seen marked William Reynolds looks like Lent. You might look at this jug and my George Lent jug and go, oh, they look similar. And they certainly do from that standpoint, right? But the lip is done a bit different, no line. And when you look at the handle, a distinctive trait to the Reynolds ones that you just don't see in a George Lent. Lent with his plugged in handle and Reynolds with uh, Tim Billy described this as a it looks like a tool was used to push there whether for decoration or a function or both but this circle you see on a lot of Reynolds jugs and uh, the handle is bent and left on the surface and that, that is certainly a, a, a different way to go about it. Uh, again, I have, <laughs> my budget affords me plain mark pieces. It's okay. okay. But whatever goes on there and whoever's making that stuff, it doesn't last long. And uh, I, I have yet to see any decoration of, of a William Reynolds that even looks complex. Uh, they're, they're relatively simple. And so uh, suddenly uh, there's an opening uh, back upstate in Lansingburg because the Lansingburg redware potter, John Haggerty, passes away. Lansingburg didn't have any stoneware going on, uh, but John Haggerty had been there since 1795 or earlier. And uh, when Haggerty dies on July 18th, in record time, jo <laughs> Lent has decided um, I'm going back. And Lent sells his interest in the Reynolds pot pottery on July 25th. I've got to think that Lent was aware of Haggerty's health, may have been aware that he doesn't have a lot of time left, because in a day and age without uh, email, that seems like an awfully quick turnaround to find out someone's past and decide to go back to a town. Uh, on August 10th, Lent buys Haggerty's property. On October 1st, Lent buys two lots uh, in town, uh, two blocks away from the property, where he's going to eventually set up his uh, shop. He actually, he buys uh, Haggerty's kiln and never uses it. And whether that was just the Redware kiln was insufficient or he didn't want competition, he was just getting it out of there. Uh, but nothing is ever done with the Haggerty property. Uh, George has another daughter. Uh, Nancy, and she marries John Haggerty's son on October 4th. So I'm guessing Lent had a relationship with the Haggerty prop, uh, family that goes back a ways. 
before uh, George Lucas discovered this whole uh, Lynn connection with Poughkeepsie, it was thought that Lynn simply went from Troy to Lansingburg. Between him trying to find a place for Ben Lynn to set up and him moving over uh, to assume uh, being a stoneware potter in Lansingburg, it's unclear, but it's interesting. The timing of things makes one think that uh, Lynn was very aware of the whole situation. Uh, eventually, in 1828, Lynn will sell the Haggerty property to a, uh, a merchant and, and be done with it. So uh, Lynn, who, for whatever reason, didn't mark a lot of pieces, whether he sold a lot of direct to merchants or was just old enough that he didn't uh, find the need to mark, uh, just didn't. And a little odd considering Paul Cushman and Israel Seymour marked everything and were so prominent in marking stoneware. Um, so as Lent, Lent is basically going to go to Lansingburg and he's going to continue working. But uh, as his sons get older, they are certainly doing a lot of the work. And William Lent, uh, his, his uh, youngest son, seems to do the, the brunt of it. Uh, William is born in 1809. Uh, ben Lent is born in 1802, but Ben Lent is, is down in New Jersey by 1820. Ben Lent marries Warren's daughter. Uh, ben Lent goes and uh, marries Margaret Warren. And if you, if you research Potter families, they tend to marry other Potters. I'm sure they're trying to keep the trade within uh, people that know and not uh, create competition, but the connection between Ben Lent and uh, the Warren family uh, certainly makes me think the Morgan apprenticeship was uh, a, a logical possibility, right? So Ben Lent is gone in 1820. He's down in New Jersey, which leaves uh, George Jr. And uh, George Jr. He's going to lead an interesting life after this, but uh, when he when he enlists in the army in 1831, he's listed as a potter from Troy. So there's a, a good amount of uh, Lent stuff probably came from the hand of George Jr. Uh, I've never seen a marked George Jr. pot. Uh, we know very little about George. I've got some interesting stuff to tell you about George coming up. William, on the other hand, stays with his father for a long time. Uh, and William, by the time they get to Lansingburg, William is uh, equal the potter of George, if not surpassed him. And William's doing a lot. But in 1835, William uh, leaves for Troy, which makes me think uh, maybe it was just time to go. But I'm thinking by uh, 1835, George Lent was ready to slow down. and. Maybe he was coming to the, the end of his potting career. Uh, now, William Lent will go live in a, he'll go rent a house in Troy on Fifth Street owned by Israel Seymour. Remember that, that feared rival? Well, I think uh, uh, William Lent going to work for Seymour would have, would have been a, an indignity to George had they been fierce rivals. But I believe they got along, and that's why William Lent, when it was time to uh, cease production in, in Lansingburg, uh, went to go work uh, for Seymour for a couple of years in Troy before setting out to Peekskill, down in that Westchester County I talked about, where so many Lents are. Uh, and a Louis B. Lent is putting up money to start a pottery, and William's going to go down there and uh, get involved in that. Now, in 1840, the federal census says that George and his wife are living with a, a uh, white female between the ages of 20 and 29. That would be Eliza Ann. And uh, Eliza was born in 1815. And it says Lent is listed as a person employed in manufacturing trade. So it's possible he's still working, maybe just uh, working part time in summers or so forth. Uh, but he also uh, appears to be lent, uh, renting out his kiln because we know that an Eliezer Orcutt is going to rent the kiln in 1843 uh, and maybe he started earlier. Uh, 
the reason we know that is he puts an ad in the paper in 1843, uh, but he could have been working there uh, sooner. And it's a laser ore cutting company. Lent is thought to be the partner, uh, whether he co-owns the partner or just letting him use his uh, facilities. All right, but Orcutt is going to be active uh, until 1847 uh, when he's found in Bennington, Vermont. And uh, so uh, George Lynch uh, several times tries to sell his uh, buildings. Uh, it's as early as 1845, he's got an ad trying to sell the buildings and his property. Uh, and in 1850, Lynch is going to die. I, He's listed as dying of consumption in Lansingburg at age 76. According to uh, the 1850 census, it says that uh, Lent had been ill for two years prior. So uh, Orca leaving 1847 may have coincided with Lent uh, being ill and closing the whole thing down. Um, when they read the will, Benjamin Lent's name is not even mentioned, which tells me that Ben Lent is probably uh, deceased and George Lent Jr., it, it states that uh, whereabouts cannot be ascertained. Uh, and so whether George Lent Jr. is alive in 1850 is, is unknown at this point. Uh, but uh, I'll finish this reading uh, the uh, notice in the newspaper. Uh, it says, sudden death. We regret to announce the sudden demise of Mr. George Lent. For many years, a useful citizen of this village he expired at his residence on Saturday morning last, after an illness of a few hours. The day previous, he was in the street, although complaining at the time of an ailing of his throat. On Friday night, he was taken worse, when the disease assumed the form of croup, which terminated his life before daylight. He retained his consciousness to the last and was perfectly resigned to his fate. He was about 70 years old. And the, the loving way it was written tells me he was a well-liked member of the community. All right, although uh, George had four sons, uh, I, I don't believe his oldest son, John, made it past uh, infancy or, or uh, young age. Uh, there's never been anything uh, to mention him uh, beyond that. And by the 1810 census, it doesn't seem to allow for uh, John to be there. So I'm going to assume that uh, he didn't live uh, beyond a couple of years, uh, which gives us Benjamin, George Jr., and William. And Benjamin, uh, I think he was a bit of a scoundrel. <laughs> uh, so let's go through Benjamin first. Uh, he's born in 1802, and he marries a Margaret Warren of South Amboy, New Jersey. Uh, says they're married in Troy in 1820 by Reverend Summers. Uh, and that would make uh, George only 18. And uh, they do have a, a bunch of kids. Um, in 1820, uh, Ben Lent is on the North Brunswick Township, New Jersey tax rolls, likely working at Old Bridge, uh, at the Morgan and Van Winkle Pottery, uh, where Branch Green is down there in the early days. Uh, Branch Green is by now is in Philadelphia but could be a part of that relationship uh, with Lent and Morgan and Green and so forth, right? But he's uh, working down in Old Bridge for a short time. Uh, he appears on the 1822 tax rolls down there. And in 1823, he's back up in Troy. So whether it didn't work or he's just looking for better work and he tries to start a, a uh, short-lived <laughs> adventure with Alexander Allen and Henry Fellers. And uh, the thought, uh, Warren Broderick uh, suggests that it didn't even get off the ground. They might have made a test piece or two, but there is a piece marked. Uh, but they, it, the thought is that they didn't even uh, ever uh, get it off the ground. And the funny thing is, uh, when they announced that this pottery isn't going to work in the Lansingburg newspaper, uh, it says the, the firm of Fellers and Allen Lint uh, is mutually dissolved. And that, which was very common in the day, they would, they would announce it in the newspaper. Well, Ben Lynn takes an advertisement underneath it to let people know that it was not mutually dissolved, right? Uh, <laughs> it says, in fact, 
Uh, let's see. Benland takes out his own ad on February 16th to state the partnership was not mutually dissolved, nor has there been any such understanding between parties. So Ben Lent is not happy at all that it didn't work out and uh, <laughs> wants everyone to know about it. Willing to pay money to let people know that. Uh, that said, he sold the rights to uh, that pottery that didn't work out for $10 to fellers. Uh, in 1825, Ben Lent turns up working at the, uh, it was the Warren and Letts pottery. Uh, after that, uh, moved on is owned by James Morgan's granddaughter, Catherine Brown. So there's that Morgan connection again uh, with Ben. In 1826, he's still working there. In fact, they have a shard that is dated 1826, made by B. Lent. And in 1827, they think he's still there because they've also found a shard marked 1827, made by B. Lent. Uh, what luck. So uh, he's, he's there for a while. In 1828, 1829, He's going to try his own thing in Caldwell, New Jersey. And that's where I'm at this big guy. Thank Bill Turnbull for this one. Ben Lent, who is a great potter. Yeah. He may not be a lot of things, but he is a great potter. It's just a beautiful form, incredibly smooth. Right. And this is marked. Ben Lent, B. Lent, Caldwell, New Jersey. Sit that right there. That is one big jug. And uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't work out, but these few Caldwell pieces I've seen are beautiful pieces. So it wasn't a quality issue. It wasn't a stoneware issue, uh, perhaps a business issue. And uh, in 1830, he shows up in the South Amboy uh, census. So working at the potteries there. Uh, in 1831, the family moves to Sotus, New York, which I had never heard of until this. Uh, it's out um, kind of Rochester way, out in the western part of the state, northwestern part of the state. And uh, I was reading in a, in a paper that Margaret Warren had a lot of family in the Sotus area. And so they may have given up on the stoneware idea and just said, we're going to you know, try something else and moved out to Sotus. I don't think he ever started a pottery out in Sotus. And uh, in several things I read, they thought that was when he, him and Margaret Warren uh, split up and he went his own ways. However, I found that I don't think so because <laughs> in 1836, James M. Lent is born in Troy to the parents, Benjamin Lent and Margaret Warren. So somehow the whole family ended up back in Troy and uh, they're obviously together. Now, 1836 is a big time because that would be the one time when I could explain where this was made. And unfortunately, this piece is not marked but in the Albany Institute of History and Art, there is a jug with this exact decoration, exact, marked, made by B&W Lent, Lansingburg. So for the brothers to work together, they need to obviously be in the same area at the same time. In 1836 is a time when William Lent is available. He's working in Troy, uh, living at the a house owned by Israel Seymour. And Ben Lent somehow is back in Troy long enough to give birth to a uh, son, James M. Lent. So I've got to think 1836, maybe 35, is the time when these two uh, brothers tried uh, to do their own thing. Now that coincides with George Lent coming to the end of his career he may have turned it over to his to his boys and said, guys, take it. And so they I don't think they made a lot. Uh, oddly enough, I did have I had a piece once with the same decoration, never knew what it was and ended up selling it. Sure wish I kept it now. Right. But this is a piece made in Lansingburg by William and Ben Lent. Right. By the form, I'm gonna guess it's Ben. And so that would be the only window where they're together. William Lent is, is less as far. He's working in Troy. 
Ben, uh, Benjamin Lent's up in uh, Troy for whatever reason, but it doesn't last long. And that would explain why you don't find pieces with that decoration. Because in 1836, Ben Lent uh, says, I had enough of this, and he's gone. Ben Lent decides uh, life is just getting too tough, I guess. And he joins the army. He enlists in the army. Uh, he enlists right in Troy on December 14th. Uh, we're not we're not engaged in a, a major conflict. The Indian Wars are certainly going on, uh, but whether it's just a, a one of his few ways to escape, or he, he may have been uh, broke, what? But uh, he's going to leave his family, his new son, and so forth, um, and go into the army, which uh, doesn't last that long. Maybe he gets homesick. Uh, maybe he just doesn't like uh, military life. But uh, by September 29th, Ben Lent deserts the army. And it's possible he goes back to SOTUS. Maybe his, uh, his wife took the kids back to SOTUS, and he goes back there because in 1838, he remembers what he didn't like about this, and he goes back into the army. Uh, Apparently you could do that back then, but on March 8th, he realists in the army under Captain Wright in Buffalo. And Buffalo is close enough to SOTUS. It's not right next door, but it's close enough that makes me think he was out uh, in SOTUS. And he joins the uh, the H Artillery Regiment and uh, he's gonna be out there for a short time. Uh, but he's listed as born in Troy, New York, occupation Potter. Well, uh, let's see, he enlisted in March, and in May 8th, he's had enough, and he deserts. So, uh, where do you go when you desert the Army twice? You go to Canada. And sure enough, uh, in 1838, Ben Lent opens a redware uh, factory on the Niagara Peninsula in Jordan, Canada West, which is uh, near Niagara Falls, for, for those of us not familiar with that area. Uh, Canada West becomes Ontario eventually. And in fact, Ben Lind doesn't just open up a new factory. Uh, he finds a new wife. And he marries a Marianne Bratt in St. Catherine's Cathedral in Ontario. <laughs> uh, they're listed both of the Low Louth Township in Lewiston, New York. Uh, so, I don't know the details there, but uh, I think you get the picture, he's he's <laughs> on the run, more or less. Now, in 1842, the Jordan Pottery burns down. Lent leaves Marianne Brett, I think leaves her in Canada, uh, and he's out of Canada because in 1843, he appears back in Caldwell, New Jersey, and he gets married again to a Phoebe Consuela. Consuela. Uh, Try not to moralize on Ben Lent, but he doesn't doesn't come off well with this information. So uh, now he's in uh, Colton, New Jersey. I assume he goes back to potting. Uh, I'm not familiar enough with the, by 1840s, uh, the potteries are quite different in uh, New Jersey. But uh, I don't think things go well because in 1847, Ben Lent is in uh, associated with John Gregory and D.W. Graves. Uh, they try to open a stoneware factory in Clinton, New York. And they announced the opening of the stoneware factory on June 8th. And on June 28th, mind you, just 20 days later, they announced in the newspaper that the Clinton pottery is closing. So whether they got a full kiln load uh, made in that time is anyone's guess, but that's going to be the last we hear of Ben Lent. And one of the possibilities is that maybe something happened to Ben Lent, and that was part of why the, the pottery closed, because uh, when his father dies in 1850, he's not even mentioned. It's not even listed in, in the reading of the will. So uh, I don't have anything else on Ben Lent, but uh, considering the, the apparent life he led, um, seems like uh, something may have befell him. Uh, let's move to George Jr., uh, who's 
in some ways the most fascinating, and yet I have very little to uh, actually show you about George Jr. Uh, I have a stand-in piece for him. I feel very confident that this is a Lent piece. And I'm gonna say Lent family at this point. Um, later Lent pieces seem to have kind of a rainbow shape to the handles. And uh, the typical uh, George Lent flower shape with the big petals on the sides and this little decoration here with the three lumps, right? Seems to be a way to get a design started or to have a fancy ground plane to it, All right? Now, the second one, also unmarked, a four petal flower that you see in a lot of George Lynn's work. Uh, with the big, this one may have been George himself. It could be Ben, but it'd be kind of fun to pretend this is George Jr. since we don't have a marked George Jr. piece. So uh, George Jr. is the one we know the least about. Uh, and probably the one I'd like to know most about. Uh, he's born 1804, and uh, he's learning the potting trade from uh, his father. I'm sure he works uh, for a time in Troy. I don't know if he ends up uh, going over to Lansingburg. Uh, George is out of uh, Troy by 1824, and somehow George Jr. ends up in Virginia, enlisting at Fortress Monroe in Hampton, Virginia in 1828. So, November 4th, 1828, he goes in and <laughs> he almost lasts a year and he deserts on October 8th, 1829. And the reason this is, is interesting is deserting was much more common back then. Farmers went back to the fields and so forth. But in this case, the army apprehends George Jr. on January 16th, 1830. Now, if, if they apprehended you, it means they were looking for you. They wanted you for some reason. Doesn't say what. Um, and he's thrown in in the uh, military prison. And uh, there's monthly notes uh, by his commanders that uh, mention he's been there since January 16th. He's there in February. Uh, in March, it says, uh, return to then eligible scribbling, obtain furlough. And I think uh, George is trying to get a furlough and is denied. Uh, he's there in April. Uh, they're called the Madison Barracks. Uh, he's there in May. The remarks are simply convict, deserter from detachment of convicts relating to court martial. So it's getting a little more serious. He's getting lined up for court martial. Uh, in June, on uh, June 12, uh, they're all pardoned. By general order on June uh, 12, 1830, uh, the men proceeding for court martial, Lent and others, it says, uh, promotions and appointments uh, relating to soldiers discharged by PARS, maybe that's pardoned, uh, pardoning all deserters relating to payments on account. Whatever that means in military talk, uh, he, he's, I, I think in exchange for being pardoned, he re-upped. It was a way for them to retain service maybe. And because that's in 1831, uh, he reports for duty at the Marine Barracks in Philadelphia under the command of a Samuel Miller. And that, that building is still standing, actually, uh, the Marine Barracks. And uh, so a couple of years go by, 1837, the officer rolls list George Lent Jr., who re-enlisted on February 7th, 1833. So I don't know what happened in between, but he's, he's coming back for more, as they'd say. In 1837, there's a muster roll for the Marines of Company A, stationed at Fort Brooks in Tampa Bay, Florida under uh, Lieutenant uh, W.L. Young. Uh, and George Lent Jr. under his name is listed deserter. Join July 5th, no returns. I'm guessing it goes too hot. I can't imagine uh, wearing the clothes they wore back then, going down to the, the swamps of Tampa Bay, uh, Fort Brook, if you will. Uh, Fort Brook would serve as a major outpost on Florida's west coast during all three Seminole Indian Wars and in the Civil War. The fort also played a part in the development of the village of Tampa. So George Jr. is involved in the, in the Seminole Indian Wars. In 1838, he's on the rolls of Company D at Fort Denaud. Uh, this is in February of 1838. 
Uh, he's listed as detached service, meaning that you're assigned to service elsewhere. Uh, now, Fort, Fort Dunod was a U.S. Army outpost established on the Calusa Bahachi River in 1837 by Captain Benjamin Bonneville. Uh, the fort was built as a blockhouse surrounded by tents. Doesn't sound like a fort to me. The post was abandoned in May of 1838, reoccupied in 1840, and abandoned again in 1842. So George is in this interesting, uh, very primitive, very early goings of the army. He's a Marine. And uh, I think very likely that George Jr. was killed uh, at some point during these Indian Wars. Uh, and nothing's heard from again until they mention that they can't find him at the reading of George's will. So that's George Jr. All right, and the last Lent son is William Lent, uh, perhaps the best known. Uh, William Lent was born in 1809 and uh, learned the craft from his father, worked hard. Uh, first time I see him on, in a piece of paper is 1828, uh, May 23rd. George, then at the time, uh, 54, and William, uh, a young 19, are both part of a small group of 34 Democrats invited to attend a town meeting at the house of Guy Gully for the purpose of choosing delegates to attend a county convention to be holding at Troy on 9th of June, next. The Democrats are very much in favor of electing Andrew Jackson, the hero of the War of 1812, for crushing the British in New Orleans in 1815. The British lost 2,100 men, the U.S. only 71. George Jr. will later fight in the Indian Wars, perhaps inspired by Jackson. Uh, ben takes off young, but William sticks around for a long time working with George. And it's just nice to see that, that he's bringing him somewhere, a little evidence on paper of their bond. Uh, in 1828, uh, William Lent uh, will marry a Mary Merchant, uh, who actually comes from Canada. I don't think there's any connection eventually with Ben Lent. Uh, it says they're both from Lansingburg at the time, but Mary Merchant's mother is from Canada. Uh, and in 1830, uh, William is living in Lansingburg officially to the U.S. Census. 1836 uh, is when Lent moves at Troy which tells me in 1835, uh, George Lent is done potting. William Lent moves to Troy, uh, living at the home owned by Israel Seymour, right? That's when they may have attempted the, the uh, b and pottery. And uh, in 1839, it still is William Lent as a potter living at the same place in Troy uh, and likely working for Seymour. So there's probably three or four years in there where there's some Seymours made by William Lent. By 1841, uh, William Lent is in Peekskill. Uh, Peekskill is down, uh, if you go down south down the Hudson. Uh, it's a little bit above New York City. And uh, that's where William is going to work as a potter in his own. And this is marked William Lent, Peekskill. And a relatively simple decoration. Not as fluid as this one, which tells me this is probably Ben, but you can see the similarity. Very close. And so uh, it's possible that William worked for uh, Samuel Hurd at a peak, in Peekskill earlier. He may have been down there in 1840, maybe 39, working for Hurd. And then he's going to partner with Louis B. Lent, a uh, a guy with money down in Westchester, uh, and uh, they're go their uh, partnership's going to last for a short time. Uh, Louis B. Lent's going to go manage a circus in 1847, and Lent does partner with uh, a, a someone named Simonson. I don't know much about that. Uh, it's possible Louis B. Lent sold his shares to Simonson, uh, but that whole thing uh, lasts for a couple of years, uh, almost a decade. Uh, until uh, William Lent decides to leave, uh, uproots, and moves to Ellenville, New York, where he's going to be uh, a, a potter, maybe the main potter for Daniel Weston. Uh, Weston's brother is just headed out to Pennsylvania, and William Lent is brought in to uh, work in Ellenville. Uh, it's going to work out quite well. 
and he's going to be in Ellenville for a uh, better part of 25 years. Uh, in the 1860, the federal uh, census has William Lent listed as a potter in Wawarsing, uh, in Ulster County, uh, very close to Ellenville, uh, with a real estate value of 300 and a personal estate worth $5,000. Uh, my guess is that he got quite an inheritance from his father. It doesn't mention it in the will per se, but I'm guessing he did quite well uh, in the will and certainly earned it working with his father all those years. Uh, George Lent was good with money and I think he rewarded his son that stuck around. Uh, now this is really neat. Remember he's born in 1809. In 1861 at age 52, he enlists in the Union Army in Kingston, New York. He's commissioned as an officer, likely because he uh, was a man of stature and had money, and he enters the Army in the rank of Captain of Company E of the New York 20th Infantry of the New York State Militia, uh, nicknamed the Ulster Guard. Uh, well, the, the Ulster Guard gets um, told that you're not just the Ulster Guard, you're uh, part of the Union Army, and you're headed uh, down to Washington, D.C. And so they muster out on August 2nd, in the heat of the summer. Uh, his unit uh, sees battle down uh, south. And he comes back six months later and uh, is discharged, honorable discharge. Uh, unlike his brothers, didn't, didn't uh, run out. Uh, and he's referred to as, as Captain Lent uh, for the the uh, remainder of his life. Uh, the unit itself served uh, honorably. Uh, they saw quite a bit of battle. And he comes back and he goes back to working at the pottery, uh, which must have been something else. And he works there till 1875. He retires from the Western Pottery and in 1878, William Lane dies at the young age of uh, 69. I don't know whether he was sustained injuries uh, in battle or not, but he passes away at age 69. And uh, William, the the, uh, the good son of George Lint, if you will, um, left quite a legacy of, of pieces, a uh, relative number of peak, uh, peak skill pieces, but lots of Ellenville pieces. I don't think he was a decorator in Ellenville. Uh, I do think he was a potter, uh, but Ellenville has very distinctive uh, decorations and uh, he oversaw a very, very successful pottery. So, that's a quick run through through George Lent and his three sons. Well, thank you, Jude. Anybody has any questions for Jude? Um, I will ask you to keep your sound off unless you want to speak up and ask a question. Um, if you'd prefer to just um, put questions in the chat box, we can convey those to Jude. Um, otherwise, um, um, we'll, we'll open the floor to questions. Jude, I'd like to ask you where that, where his pottery was, where you dug up that shard. Uh, it's right on the corner of Fourth and Ferry in Troy, and amazingly, the building is still intact. <laughs> wow, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and I, I literally I just walked over and asked. I found the owner. He he owns a bar a couple of streets over, and I just asked him, "Would you mind if I dug?" And he said, "Yeah, I don't care." Wow. <laughs> and I spent the next two years digging every chance I got. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. This is my first Zoom meeting, so I really don't know what I'm doing with this. And Betty's trying to coach me in with it, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> well done. I have a question for Jude, if I could. Sure. Jude, it's John. Good that time. was uh, tremendous. And your, your uh, historical uh, digging, so to speak, is exceptional. Let me follow up on Kevin's question, though, because mm -hmm. I had a question. You know, when you said you had found thousands of shards, what, why do you think there are so many? I mean, I came up with a couple, three ideas. One was, you know, bad pottery and they just broke it. Uh, or uh, maybe on Friday after a few beers, they got into a fight. You know? <laughs> or, or, you know, what, what, why, do you, why do you think that might be, Jude? So uh, many. I think it's a great question. I've seen, you know, other potteries with their, their waster piles. I can't imagine they drop that many pieces. Uh, it, maybe, you know, uh, accidents in the kiln with all the stacking is a, certainly a possibility. Uh, my other thought was because of where I found it all, it's in an alleyway right next to the uh, pottery. And it's always been an alleyway. As far back on the maps as I could find, it's always been this small alley. 
And maybe all of that refuse was put there as a way of um, kind of like a primitive way to pave the alleyway from all the mud and so forth. So it, it may have had a, it was, it's, there's rarely I found a shard that's bigger than maybe two or three inches. So it tells me it's been crushed over the years and years. Um, but how they, how, why the pottery would have all the shards? <laughs> uh, you know, my only guess, I guess if you knocked over one stack, you end up with a lot of shards, you know? Um, but it's a great question because, you know, stoneware doesn't break that easy. <laughs> <laughs> there, there normally is a uh, 10 to 15% breakage with doing stoneware. It's just something you can't help. Oh. Um, Jer Jerry tried to get it down to 5% when he was firing um, in York, Maine. <clears throat> Even at Norton, we have just using clay, uh, making grinding wheels, it's the same thing. We can never get it below 5%. 5% was always a reject uh, figure. Uh, now I'm sure and with the old kilns, it was a lot higher. Sure. Oh, well, that's a perfect answer then. <laughs> I have, I've seen in the Norton pile, that I got to pick when they were digging the street, there was a ton of the smaller jugs. And it seemed like the smaller jugs took a hit. Um, I never found one intact. I just found the tops and the, and the handles. Right. Uh, but something you don't see a lot of either is the smaller pieces. Yeah, hmm. that, that's, <laughs> that's bothered me ever since I started digging. And that's fantastic to, to hear such a, a reasonable explanation. Yeah. I haven't done a lot of digging at sites, but, you know, I have done some surface looking at um, Jonathan Fenton's early um, Dorset Hollow site, 1800 to 1810. So it hasn't, it was only in service for 10 years. Um, it hasn't been in service for, uh, for 210 years and it, the, the ground was still covered. Um, mm. So th th they did have a lot of loss. Mm. And I can only imagine how many people just walked by and picked up a shard here and there over the 200 years it's been sitting there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's basically an alleyway that people used to cut through the streets. So I'm sure if something caught someone's eye, they picked it up over time. And yet I still, I, I must have 10,000 shards in boxes. <laughs> wow. From the day one I started digging, I kept everything and then I just kept it up and kept it up and pretty soon I regretted that <laughs> philosophy, but. <laughs> I, I, had a, I had a question, Jude. Um, first, first, I wanted to thank you for such an incredible presentation and such uh, detailed work. It's completely inspiring, especially on the early material, which is hard to uh, uh, get, um, harder to find records the earlier it is. But I, I had a question about the medallions. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen them associated with various New Jersey potteries, especially the Morgan pottery. And I think Sims, on some of the Sims excavations, there are examples of those mm -hmm. that he attributes. I'm wondering if those are uh, measure exactly the same or whether you've looked to compare to see if they're just similar. The or, only maybe, one, or maybe whether those stamps traveled up and down the Hudson. Right. Um, the only one, that, uh, Tim Bailey has measured the four hearts from a piece that was, was felt to be a New Jersey piece and from a Troy piece. And they did measure about a quarter inch difference which is beyond the, uh, and Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of beyond the expected shrinkage of clay. Um, certainly when you stamp it, it's gonna affect how much it would move. Um, but the, the common denominator there is Branch Green, who uh, precedes Lent, but is there at the same time also. And I'm sure if Green was using them up in Troy that he introduced them down in, in uh, Old Bridge, uh, certainly because other than that, Branch Green seems to use the same roulette on everything. Uh, makes me think he's not a decorator and a stamp is such a perfect, you know, way to get around that. Uh, but, you know, separating, uh, I found, I think, three shards of one complete sun face and two uh, partial. And the sun face, which is such a, um, a well-known, I think, uh, medallion uh, that's always attributed in New Jersey. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, getting this information out there and, and uh, explaining it, but then you have to factor in trade and, you know, Ben Link going back and forth. And there's so much, you know, common uh, ancestry there that I think it's pretty easy to either have several stamps or travel with it, you know. Um, oh, another interesting aspect is that in the back of George Lent's pottery was a tinsmith shop. And we don't know how far back the tinsmith goes. 
Um, but Tim and I were, um, were ruminating that maybe George Lynn also was a tinsmith. I mean, it's so hard to, to know because these guys did so many things themselves. Um, but, you know, the medallions could be a, a lifetime study in itself. You know, there's so many little variations and until you can get them all in the same room and do just what you're saying, measure them and really see if they're really as similar as they look. You know, uh, I found one, uh, I found a fish and every time I find a fish medallion picture, I'm comparing it and it's never the same exact fish, even though it looks like it at first and you compare it, it's like, oh, it's a little bit different here and there. So um, yeah, so many, you know, and the, and the idea that you could stamp it and then maybe take a needle tool and adjust it or change it, you know. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Jude, we have a couple of um, questions here in the chat. Um, I'll just um, read them out here in, in order. So Sylvia Lovegren asked, is there any chance that there's an undiscovered privy at that site? Um, I would assume it, <laughs> there has to be one somewhere. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the back side uh, was paved at one time and it sat un, unused for so long that it then regrew a dirt layer in weeds. And to get through the back half of the lot would be really difficult. But I, I've always been told they keep the privy as far downwind as they can from the, <laughs> the dwelling. Um, so I have an idea where it might be. It's just, uh, you know, honestly, should the city ever decide to dig up that area, I'll be the first one watching every, you know, shovel full of coming out of the ground. Um, who knows what's still in there? I've only dug the unpaved areas, you know, that I could. And part of what preserved what I did um, dig up was the, the meat market. There's a pork store there for 80 years. And they, that was the, where their cooler sat. And so the cooler more or less protected that site for all that time. And when the new owner had it removed, it exposed that whole area. So, you know, that area had been roughly undisturbed since 1920-ish, which, you know, <laughs> uh, was something significant. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I still go back uh, every once in a while and just walk around and see what the rain is washed away. And I never don't come away with a couple of pieces that I missed somewhere along the way. You know? So we have a, another question from um, Vince Martonis. Did the Lentz make bottles or ink wells? Uh, I've never, I, the only, the only evidence maybe of bottles is I found um, several very uh, small um, lips that could have been from a, you know, a quart jug, um, possibly bottle, but uh, certainly nothing marked that I know of. And I didn't uncover anything. I did find an 1840s bottle uh, in the mix from a uh, Albany pottery. So at some point they had I'm sure it's just somebody digging and drinking at the same time who dropped their bottle. Um, but when I found that, that was a, that was kind of a, a curveball for a bit until I figured out where it came from. Um, but other than that, no evidence of bottles or inkwells, but I can't imagine they didn't, you know, um, the number of plain inkwells out there that could be from anyone. Um, you want me to read them, or uh, Jamie, or? Um, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I've, I've gone through um, and asked the, most of the questions. I mean, many of them are just thanking you, of course, um, for your presentation. Um, there, wa there was, Dina was wondering if you wanted to share some of the other pottery from, from your cupboard. I know um, pe people oh. always love just look at, looking at pieces. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> um, I'll just grab a couple. Hang on. <laughs> I'll do this quick. Well, some, somebody, somebody who didn't change their name, I, I, I should say. It wasn't, what wasn't the real Dina. <laughs> I had to turn on my camera to figure out which I was, because there's so many <laughs> Deanna's, you're not sure which one is you. Grabbed a couple quick. <laughs> um, so 
I know people like a story with it. So uh, this was the one I showed uh, first. I happen to have two of the same medallion. <laughs> and the handles are similar, not, not exactly the same, but consistent. You know, I don't think any two pieces of stoneware are ever exactly the same, right? Um, but the notable thing is the little bit of cobalt here and then the splash and mess of cobalt. And it's those little things that you can obsess over. Is it a different potter? Probably just drop the brush or something. You know, I try to, I try to keep it logical and simple, but it's amazing how you start, you know, divide and conquer with all this stuff. And maybe this is this person, maybe this is this person. Then I, I got this great one I found on eBay. That's just a mess of a jug, but it's got the two rings that are common with the earlier, the earlier pieces, uh, maybe pre lit maybe part of uh, Branch Green and Troy, but the double ring here with a really, um, <laughs> really poorly applied handle to be nice. And I wonder, part of me wonders if this isn't a green attempt, green who's known for putting both uh, terminals of the handle on the body itself and not putting it on the spout. I wonder if this possibly isn't an early green where for whatever reason, it just doesn't work out for them. Uh, and it's a bit of a mess. Uh, no, no real decoration other than these four. Uh, they're not finger marks, they're, they're brush marks. Uh, but that, that, there's a possibility that this is a very early Troy piece. And on the marked Chapman piece that they had at the Troy factory that Tim had at his shop, um, all the ridging was still uh, visible on that pot. And for whatever reason, uh, uh, same thing on here. I don't know if it comes up okay on the camera, but you can see the visible, they didn't, they didn't shave it down at the end when they were uh, doing it on the wheel. Um, so that's in the interesting <laughs> Troy shelf. And then this one, um, most likely this is a New York City piece. However, um, this, this flower, Let's see if I can keep it in focus as I show you. All right, it's exquisitely done. A uh, very, very careful incising, carefully applied cobalt. And uh, this is certainly something on the early, uh, whether it's all early Albany or Troy pieces, uh, you see this kind of a decoration that uh, Link kind of gets looser and looser with over time. I think there's a chance this could be lint in Cornwall uh, and, you know, never going to know, but, uh, but it's those, those little similarities and things you're looking for. Uh, the color of the clay, uh, on the screen, it looks quite washed out, but it's, it's very tan. It's very an orangey tan. Uh, and a lot of the Cornwall pieces have that same coloring. I think my lights are washing this out a bit, but, uh, and on the back is kind of a, a typical thing of the pre-1800. Um, not sure what that is intended to be other than maybe just decorative. But. Dude, does that have a liner glaze inside, an Albany liner? Uh, it doesn't. Um, it, it's very chipped up inside and uh, there, there's no Albany glaze. It's, it's a little dark from, from exposure, uh, but it's very chipped up, oddly enough. So I can't imagine they were mixing a lot of things in it. Um, Maybe there was an attempt to put something in and it all chipped off, you know, just, just fell off. Uh, but it doesn't have any, um, any evidence. Uh, it's, in fact, it's, um, I'd almost call it like a black, like more of a burn to it than, a, uh, you know, Albany slip. Um, and then uh, this one uh, came from the Dan Bruin collection. Um, who is, who's, from what I can tell, the best Mid-Hudson Valley collector out there. Uh, he recently put a lot of stuff up at auction. I was lucky to come away with this one. And um, it's just unrefined enough to, to, in my opinion, seem out of the city. Whereas New York City stuff seems so precise and, and so experienced. Um, I, I, I just adore this bowl. 
It's got the open handles. Um, they're not they're not way out there, but they are separated from the body. And I recently came across an image that makes me think that this is a tobacco leaf. Um, I don't know how you really store tobacco back then, or now for that matter, but um, I, I saw an advertisement with a single leaf like that. And I've seen this on several things. There's an ST brewer that's on the internet you see a lot. Uh, I think that's a tobacco leaf. So maybe for drying or something, but that one is no slip either. Uh, it's a little brownish from, from you know being in the kiln, but no slip applied certainly. Um, and knowing that Lent and, and Darrell Williams was down there too, another uh, big potter, but knowing Lent in that Cornwall area in that in those early days, I'm always trying to, you know, try to find something to, to link it all together. And you just end up with more questions, I think, than, than answers. Um, but it sure is fun looking for them, you know. Um, is there anything you see that you'd like to see? Uh, oh. Um, <laughs> this one I thought I'd share because I think this is, is a this is kind of a this came from Warren Hartman uh, who uh, you know could I'd love to see the books he could write um, this is an early Helen Clark pot uh, when Nathan Clark first started out in Athens uh, he's 1806 to 1811 and this real playful decoration that disappears quickly. And I think it's because this is actual Nathan Clark made piece. And uh, by the time he gets busy in his, in his running uh, busy pottery, you see a lot of these uh, traits go away. Uh, these very, very flat handles with sharp corners on them uh, that he taught to Nichols. Nichols does do a kind of version of this, but you don't see this on a lot of the end Clark stuff that comes later. And uh, this butterfly and a star or a flower very whimsical, kind of like the early, you know, Morgan and stuff. And then on the back, uh, hopefully you can see this and hold this in the right spot. It's a federal eagle that they didn't bother to put the wings on. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they gave up or ran out of time before they had to put it in the kiln. But uh, what's interesting, it's got the Clark. Clark birds are not really well-known birds. Uh, Clark and Fox or Nathan Clark Jr. But they had this single blue dot for the eye, and this bird has it too. And I don't, I don't have, you know, it's just a dot. There's not a lot of different ways to make an eyeball, <laughs> but it, it's reminiscent of a Clark bird, despite the uh, very interesting subject matter for a Clark. Um, and I just, I just think there's such an interesting piece to be so whimsical on one side, and then so patriotic on the other. And then the fact that it's made it, and here in two, you know, 2021, I'm looking at it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm happy to keep showing pieces, but. Uh, there are a couple more um, questions, Jude. I'll just, um, yeah, sure. um, uh, Sylvia Levgrenick asked another question. There was a Chapman on the passenger list on the um, the boat story that you mentioned. Yeah. Is there any rela relation to the Troy Chapman? No Chapman I could find. The problem with a name like Chapman is there's so many Chapmans, period, <laughs> that I bet there wasn't a boat that didn't have a Chapman on it. Um, it's it's kind of like when you're trying to uh, chase Nathan Clark and everyone's named Clark. <laughs> um, I, I hunted down what I could uh, and uh, nothing to, to tie it in. Uh, by then, uh, the best guess is that Chapman was actually uh, deceased by 1828 and maybe as early as 1826. So that would be a year or two before he passes away. Um, his son actually becomes a, a well-known um, publisher of a magazine on um, the, um, when the Quakers split, <laughs> uh, they go into a kind of a, a conservative and a, 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 a new methodology. Uh, his son becomes very popular with that, but there's no evidence that any of them went into the trade of uh, stoneware or potting or anything. Maybe the next time I do this will be Chapman. Chat, if you think Ben Scoundrel, Ben Lent's interesting, uh, Chapman was into medical electricity and all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank you, Jude. If if 
anybody else has any questions, um, we're welcome. To, we certainly can take them, but um, um, I'm not seeing any more um, over here on the right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's been a wonderful presentation. Um, um, and I'll just say before we close up here, um, you know, I, I know Lorraine said at the beginning, um, you know, her and Steve have, have really been um, um, the organizers behind these events, but there is a small team of people who are, are, are already um, in the process of, of making plans for making sure that we continue forward um, with the Stoneware Collector Group meetings, um, with these um, um, lectures, and hopefully when we can meet in person again um, with the sales. So um, we're making plans for this um, um, next spring. Um, and as soon as we have those all in place, we'll be letting everybody um, know through all the various channels. So um, thank you so much again, um, Jude. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, and thank you everybody for attending and um, we'll be in touch soon.